Howdy folks, welcome to lesson 21 of my Network Plus course. This lesson is going to be about the topic called spoofing. So what is this magical thing called spoofing you ask? Well folks, generally it comes down to pretending to be something or someone that you're not. So spoofing is not something specific per se. Spoofing can actually be a lot of things. But usually spoofy comes down to forging something. You're pretending to be something you're not. So when I say forging something, you probably want a couple of examples. So when it comes to examples, this could be an email address. Very common one. So you or the user would receive an email from an entity or a person that pretends to be someone that you know or feel comfortable with. So I can, for example, send you an email and I can pretend to be your bank. Now, if I'm just going to send you a random email and I pretend to be a bank, that's going to look pretty fishy, especially if you go look at the address that it's coming from and it doesn't look like it's coming from the bank. But if I send you an email and it actually legit looks like it's coming from the bank, if you go look at the email address, then you or the user might be a lot more inclined to actually believe this email. That's one of the reasons why people do spoofing is to trick people into doing something they're not supposed to do. So I might trick the user into giving me sensitive information because they think this email is legit coming from the bank. Meanwhile, it's not coming from the bank. Other examples of spoofing folks, this could also be a phone number. The phone numbers are actually a lot easier than you might think. So if you go look at entities, once again, like the bank. And a lot of countries, maybe not all countries, when the bank calls you, it's sometimes from an ungodly long number. Now, these scammers and stuff, they sometimes take advantage of that. So when they call you, they will also call you from an ungodly long number and they'll pretend to be the bank. And now people are going to think it's the bank because, well, it looks similar to the bank's number, maybe not exactly. Although you can also go and spoof that, by the way. You can go and spoof a phone number as well. But generally, it just needs to look similar to the bank or this entity. And um, this victim is going to fall victim to it because, well, it looks like it's the bank's phone number. And very often, these perpetrators, these threat actors, we call these bad guys in IT threat actors, very often these threat actors will ask you the exact same questions that the bank or whoever would have asked you. They're going to ask you what's your ID number or your social security number, your name, your last name, date of birth. Same stuff. The bank would ask to verify your identity. And they're asking the same questions, but not to verify if you are who you claim to be, but because they want to steal your identity. Other kinds of spoofing you get, folks, is IP address spoofing. So, yes, you do get IP address spoofing, folks. That is a thing. More on that in just a moment. So I'm going to give you guys examples of each and every one of these in this video. We're going to go into each and every one of these and briefly explain what they're all about. So we'll go into that in just a moment. And then, folks, this can also be MAC address spoofing. So MAC address, in case you don't know, is your hardware address of your device. Some folks call this the physical address on a device. Apparently, you can change this, but let me tell you, you can change that. And then the last one I'm going to cover in this video, which I'll explain to you guys, is website spoofing. So I'm going to go make a fake website, going to make it look like just like the real website. And the whole idea behind that is to trick the user into, well, entering information most likely that they're not supposed to. This can be something as simple as a fake Facebook page or a fake Instagram page or a fake X page. And I'm going to get you to type in your username and password in hopes of getting it and then, you know, getting up to some sort of shenanigans that I'm not supposed to be doing. All right, so let's cover the first one we have on this list. Email address spoofing, folks. So we kind of already explained this one already, did we not? So this is someone sending you or a user an email pretending to be from somewhere they're not, or pretending to be someone they're not. So I can send you an email, like I said, and I can pretend to be the bank, an entity you know or feel comfortable with, or this can even be an individual. Maybe you know a certain person personally, and I'm going to send you an email pretending to be that friend or that colleague, whoever it might be. So instead of an entity like a bank or a company, it can be an individual that I'm trying to spoof here in the hopes of maybe possibly getting information out of you. If you guys are wondering what this looks like, here's a bit of an example for you guys. It's an old example, but it serves its purpose. So you should always check where an email is coming from. Now, unfortunately, that is not a foolproof solution, guys. So if you receive an email that seems too good to be true, it seems suspicious, always check 
where is this email coming from? So if you see, for example, this email is coming from an at gmail.com address, but they're claiming to be from your bank. Yeah, no, that's not your bank, guys. Now, unfortunately, even if it does look like it's coming from a legitimate source, that doesn't guarantee that it's legitimate. There is ways and means, which is actually not that difficult, by the way. You'll learn about this in Security Plus. There is ways and means you can go and spoof someone or something's email address and pretend to be that someone or something. Scary, right? Now, luckily for us these days, there's lots of software that can help aid us in um, the fighting this kind of crime and all that. Because um, unfortunately, even if you were the world's best technician, if the email looks legit, then it looks legit. How are you going to know? Unless there's something suspicious typed in the body of the email that claims, hey, give us your username and password, you're not going to know. IT people might realize something is fishy that's going on because if they claim to ask for something weird in the email, you're going to probably think, well, hang on a moment. The bank would never ask me for my username and password. But unless they ask you for something funky and suspicious, even an IT individual would not know that this email is fake or real. So in that case, you're going to need some security software that can check the actual source the actual IP address where it's coming from. Fortunately for you guys, we get software like that these days. Right, folks, and then moving on to the second topic in spoofing. That was the phone number and caller ID spoofing. So sometimes they can go and mimic the exact phone number as is. It will literally look identical. Other times it'll just look similar. And especially if this is a very, very long number, then it does just needs to look similar. Then the user's going to believe it. So this is someone calling you from a number that seems like it might be from a certain organization. For example, the bank. I'm using the bank a lot as an example today because that's one of the most common scams you get out there. So I feel like I need to kind of give you guys a heads up so that you know that what you're in for. Now the goal here, folks, is generally to make the person feel more comfortable in answering the call and also often to trick people into thinking it's from a certain organization. So if you see a phone number calling you and you know this phone number, it looks like an entity that you know very well, you feel comfortable with them, the chances are more likely that you can actually answer this phone and the chances are also more likely that you're going to go and give information that you're not supposed to be giving over the phone. So it's to trick the user in the end of the day. That's the end goal here, guys. Now, folks, this could also be someone that's calling you from a number that appears to be local, you know, local in the sense of it's in your state or your province, or local in the sense of it appears to be in your country, meanwhile it's coming from out of your country. Meanwhile, it's actually from very far away, sometimes in a different country. This is especially the case with scam calls, guys. It's very possible to do this, in case you guys didn't know. You'll find there's a lot of folks out there. I'm not going to mention which countries are the most guilty of this. You can ask me afterwards offline if you want to. But there's certain countries that's very guilty of this. They will phone you from that country, the scammers. And um, it's going to look like it's a local call in your country. Meanwhile, it's not a local call. It's coming internationally, that call, folks. All right, moving on to the third kind of spoofing I had originally on my list. IP address spoofing, folks. So you can probably guess what this is about. It's about faking an IP address. In other words, faking an IP address to hide your real one. That could be a possible reason. So this is most likely because the threat actor, the bad guy in IT, is up to no good. And when they're up to no good, they don't want you to find or see their real IP because you could possibly trace them. So because of that, they're going to go and hide their IP, possibly use a fake IP. Now, IP address spoofing folks can also sometimes be used not necessarily to hide my real IP, but sometimes it's just to go and bypass certain securities. So just like you get a Mac filter, if you guys know what a Mac filter is, you sometimes get what we call IP address filters. It's a filter of sorts that checks your IP address. And depending on who you are and where you want to go to, it may block you, it may allow you. So if you have your own normal original IP address, it might block you. But if I go and grab just the right IP address and pretend to be just the right IP address, the security in that company or in that environment might just allow me to go and access what I want to go and access. So it could be used as a means to gain access to stuff you're not supposed to gain access to. Now, IP address spoofing folks can also commonly be used to trick systems into registering the wrong MAC address. Now folks, this is generally referred to as ARP poisoning for those of you who don't know. So to help aid with this explanation, I'm going to drop two machines here for you guys. So imagine for a moment, we are the machine there on the left. That's me, that's you. We are that machine on the left. Then we've got a machine there on the right. Now if we would like to access that machine on the right, what do we need? 
we need its IP address. Now, when I access its IP address, my machine is going to basically memorize that machine's MAC address. And the next time I want to go and send something to that machine, I'm just going to go and type in the IP address and it's going to automatically send it to that MAC address. Switches in a network, guys, normally does forwarding based on MAC address. So if I type in the IP address, it's going to go and check, okay, that's right, the MAC address for that machine previously was the following, so let me send it to that. Now these perpetrators, these threat actors, they take advantage of that, guys. This can also possibly be something else, like a router. So let's use that as an example. I'm going to swap that other PC to a router. And to further help aid of this, let's give both of these machines an IP address. You'll see I've also added a MAC address. So the router is .1, so it's 192.168.0.1. And the machine that we are using is .5. Each of these devices has their own MAC address. Now, when I go to that machine on the left and I type in the IP address of that router, my machine on the left is going to memorize and remember the MAC address of that router. So the next time I need to send information to that IP address, it's going to go to that MAC address of the router. Now, what these perpetrators will go and do when it comes to R poisoning, so to help aid of this even further, I'm going to drop another machine here. That other machine just next to the router, guys, is the threat actor. The IT bad guy, if you want to call it that. Now, they're going to go and mimic the IP address. You can see there I'm adding the same IP address there for that machine as the router. But that device has got a different MAC address than the router. That perpetrator will now go and inject themselves into the memory of that PC, the memory of my PC. And uh, they're going to basically go and swap the MAC address, if you want to call it like that. And the next time me or you are on that PC on the left, when we type in that IP address or when we send information to the IP address, we might think it's going to the router. Meanwhile, it's not going to the router. It's going to that threat actor, guys. They're diverting the traffic. They're tricking the traffic to go to them instead of the router. And this can be bad if you look at things like usernames and passwords and possibly anything else that might be sensitive. So they're injecting themselves there. All right, folks, and then moving on to another one we had on our list, MAC address spoofing. So if you don't remember, MAC address is also often referred to as the hardware address. Some people call this the physical address. Some people call this the burnt-in address. It's a physical address of any device. It's not just limited to laptops and desktops. This can be a server. It can be an access point. It can be a firewall. It can be a tablet. It can be a phone. It can be a printer, for crying out loud. Any device, folks, that you can go and connect to the network via cable or wireless has a MAC address. Now, apparently, we cannot change these MAC addresses. At least that's what they like you to believe. But we can. Sometimes we can. You're not supposed to. And when we do that, you can basically go and do identity theft. And when you do that, you can basically go and frame someone else's machine for doing something not so nice. So with MAC addresses, this is also referred to as a physical address or a burnt-in address, folks. Or like I said, a hardware address. Mac spoofing is changing the physical address of your device, the hardware address, which is normally located on the network card, your NIC, Network Interface Card. Nowadays, folks, many drivers will actually allow the MAC address to be changed. If you go use a virtual machine, you'll definitely be able to go and change it. But sometimes, if you have just the right drivers or just the right software, you'll notice you can actually go and change the MAC address. It's simply a matter of knowing how and where. And when it comes to changing your MAC address, folks, this can be for both legitimate and non-legitimate reasons. But let's face it, this is probably going to be for illegitimate reasons, not so nice reasons. This could be because maybe you want to go and bypass a MAC filter. So if you look at something like a wireless network in a company, um, instead of having a password or just a password, they will go and put what we call a MAC filter. Now, since we know the MAC address on any device is unique, when you try and join that wireless network, let's say there's no password on it, it's going to check your MAC address. And if your MAC address is not in that filter, think of this as a whitelist or a blacklist. If you are not on the allowed list, it's not going to allow your device to connect to that wireless network. But if you are on that list, then you're going to be able to connect to it. So the technician would normally go and pre-create this whitelist. They'll go and pre-add all the MAC addresses for all the devices that's allowed to connect to that wireless network. Sometimes they'll even remove the hassle of the password since you're going to be blocked by the MAC address filter. I would not suggest removing the password because an extra layer of security has never harmed anyone. Um, in fact, that's actually good for you. So the more security you have, the better. 
Now, if you would like to get onto this wireless network, you know, would it be a company one, corporate one, personal one? If you would like to get onto this wireless network, it's got a MAC filter. You can go and spoof the MAC address of one of the allowed devices. Now, to be able to do that, you need to know what the MAC address is of one of these allowed devices. Now, that's surprisingly not as difficult to get a hold of as you might think. It's actually surprisingly quite easy. Now, once you've got the MAC address of one of the allowed devices, you simply go and spoof that MAC address. You try and connect again and press the behold, you are gonna have access, folks. All right, and then moving on to the last kind of spoofing I had on my list for you guys today, website spoofing. Did give you guys a very brief description earlier. So that is when I go and make a website, and it's basically a fake website, and I make it look like some sort of well-known original website. Possibly something like Facebook. I'm just using it as an example. Usually this is in the hopes of tricking the user into entering their login details. This can possibly be used for other details as well. Maybe I want to go and steal people's banking information or something like that. But it can possibly be used to get a hold of usernames and passwords. So it's a website pretending to be another. It looks the same as the original, but it is fake, folks. So this website spoofing or any kind of spoofing you'll find is normally combined with other kinds of attacks. So when it comes to website spoofing, folks, this is normally used in combination with a phishing attack to gain access to sensitive user details like login details. So phishing means I'm phishing for sensitive user details like usernames and passwords. Now common examples of websites that's being spoofed, folks, that could be login pages of banks. This could be social media, like I mentioned. This could be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or as they call it nowadays, X. I just don't want to put X there because maybe they're going to think it's a it's a no-no website, a naughty little website. The X just looks naughty. Meanwhile, we know it's social media, but yeah, I don't want to get the YouTube popo on my case here. All right, folks, that's it for today's lesson. Hopefully, you know a little bit more about spoofing today. So if you want practice questions, guys, that you can find in the same playlist. So if you haven't found them yet, just go and check in the same playlist. It's the N Plus playlist on my channel. If you want more practical based questions, you can find that on my Patreon. The link for that is in the video description down below. Um, or just stay tuned until the end of the video, then the link is going to show on the video anyway. And then folks, if you want to join my Discord server, we do have a Discord server. That's also in the video description down below. Feel free to go and check that out as well. All right, folks. And then before we conclude this video, just a shout out and a thank you to all the supporters and the sponsors of this channel. Thank you very much, guys. All of you guys making donations especially you guys that's making paypal donations in the background thank you very much to all the patreons supporting the channel uh, here's a list of some of the patreons these are just the ones that's allowing me to display their names uh, most of them want to stay anonymous so to the guys that's displaying the names here to the anonymous patreons thank you to all of you guys thank you very much guys and then just to repeat if you guys want more practical based questions you can find that in my patreon um, if you want to join my discord server that link is also in the video description down below Right, folks, see you in Lesson 22 of the Network Plus.